time, we will take a motion to direct the city manager to add agenda items to future agendas. Council Member Martin. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I would like to move to add um, the resolution that the council members received in their email this afternoon to the agenda, the consent agenda for the next regular meeting. Whether it would be appropriate since next week isn't a regular session um, to uh, suspend the rules so that the council could debate it. Mayor and council, you could vote at this meeting to make next week's meeting a regular meeting. Otherwise, you could suspend at the time uh, at next week. Before we decide on any procedural votes, let's let's first have uh, any sort of debate on this motion. Uh, council Member Peck, or I mean Christensen, sorry. Um, I don't really think it's appropriate for us to spend our time debating ballot issues in city council. These are statewide ballot issues, and I I really don't uh, see why we would be debating them. We, we all vote on these and I, I don't see the necessity of spending our time and the public's time debating state ballot issues. Council Member Martin. Um, I find that a surprising attitude because uh, last year, Council Member Christensen was in favor of a number of resolutions in support of uh, legislation going on at the state level, certainly we should debate it. I mean, you guys can vote it down if you want to, but I think we should debate it. Just uh, quickly before we weigh in, um, I don't think there's anything inappropriate about weighing in as a council on state measures, uh, measures, say for instance, that RTD is taking. Uh, we obviously can take positions on these things as a council, whether we do or not is a different story, but. I feel that it's wholly appropriate to do so. Uh, so as such, seeing no other debate, I will take the vote. All in favor of Councilmember Martin's motion, say aye. 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 All, in, all opposed, say nay. Nay. So the measure passes five to one with Councilmember Christensen dissenting. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Attorney, City Attorney May, if we can have a procedural motion in the next meeting, not to make the whole thing a regular session, but to hold a vote on one specific item. Uh, Mayor and Council, Eugene May, City Attorney. Um, generally, it's either regular session or study session is the way that our council rules of procedure are set up. Uh, I think you could uh, vote to have just that one item it may be confusing for the public, uh, not knowing if, it, if it's labeled a study session, then they think uh, maybe that there isn't any formal final action that is gonna take place. Uh, so I, I would think that uh, the structures laid out in the council rules of procedure are those that would, would be followed. Right, seeing none, we, I guess, will move on to the public invited to be heard, according to my, my script. I'm here tonight in anticipation of the city of Longmont turning 150 years old in 2021. But paired with that excitement, it's concerned for the fear of its 175th birthday in 2046. Presently, the greatest detriment to Longmont's preservation is holes in the city's demolition requirements for historic neighborhoods and the lack of a full-time planner for historic preservation and the missing or lost architectural guidelines within the new streamlined zoning of the city. The demolition process does not require presentation or feedback from the Historic Preservation Commission. In streamlining the city's zoning, Hena lost their RLE zoning, which addressed architectural guidelines for new additions. First, any new construction compatibility should be de determined by the roof's pitch and overhang, window size and orientation or exterior materials. Second, new construction incorporating elements from a single architectural period. A craftsman front porch doesn't belong on a Victorian home.
quick update for you. I wanted to start off with this afternoon, um, Boulder County did release um, a, a press release and, and you'll see in some of the data, they have seen a slight downward trend in the number of new cases among 18 to 22 year old residents over the last week. Um, they are seeing some increases in the other age groups. So when you see this screen, uh, this is the dial screen that we've been talking about. When you look at, and this is the one that CDPHE has, has put out, um, what you can see is we are in the red in terms of the number of cases we've been seeing. Again, when you see the other charts, um, you, you can see that it's related to um, the growth that we've seen in 18 to 22 year olds. You can see the, obviously the spike that we hit in cases when we were talking about uh, what we were seeing with 18 to 22 year olds, um, it's, it's been going down. Um, the last few days have been pretty good in terms of the number of new cases. Um, this is really the chart that shows the impact of that 18 to 22 year old population. Um, just a reminder that as we're watching these numbers, we continue, we need to continue um, doing what I call the big three, wear your face mask, socially distance and practice good hygiene. Um, obviously, you can see that slight uptick that they're referring to in all of the other population groups. Um, but in 18 to 19, you can see where it peaked and now they're moving down. They hope that the mitigation efforts continue performing and, and show a, a further decrease. Same with 18 to 22 year olds. Um, and then uh, this graph, they're now, they now have the scale set and you can obviously see where the bulk of the cases are within Boulder County. Um, if you'll remember, I think last time the available med surge beds was somewhere in, in this area. It's now back in the yellow. Um, and then the ICU beds, they've moved into the red. Uh, but again, um, what we're seeing locally in terms of patients admitted for COVID, Dan indicated that there were two today in Longmont. Let's hand it off to uh, Jim Golden and let's do the 2021 budget presentation. Here in City Council, <laughs> Teresa Malloy, budget manager. So I am joined uh, by Melody Polero. Um, so Melody, if you wouldn't mind joining me, please. Um, and together, Melody and I are gonna cover for you the priority-based budgeting. Then we have Annie and her staff, and she's gonna talk to you about sustainability followed by uh, Valerie, and she's gonna cover the Next Light programs. And then uh, David Hornbacher will talk, talk about advanced metering. And then Sandy's gonna cover the public, uh, the Longmont public media. And finally, Jim is gonna wrap it up with those final three topics for you this evening. My comments this evening on regarding the priority-based budgeting are gonna be pretty brief for you since we did just provide a more in-depth review of our process for several of you back in June. The city's priority-based budgeting data has been updated to reflect the 2021 proposed budget. The quartile graph on the top here shows the 2021 proposed budget. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Melody, who's gonna take you to our PBB model that is available on, on the public's, um, on the, Avail available to the public on the city's website. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I am Melody Polero, the Senior Budget Analyst with the city. So as Teresa mentioned, this is our budget prioritization information that we have out on our website. And then at the very bottom of this screen, we have a tutorial video that will walk you through the website I will be walking you through tonight. And then we also have an email address if there's any questions, there's an email that the public um, can access that we can respond to. So this is our um, PBB online data website, and this is a nice um, capture of all of the information we put together during our priority-based budgeting process. I am going to focus on the housing services, amenities, and opportunities for all. So if you click on that, if we scroll down, this will open up a tree plot, which is all of the departments that have programs allocated to this specific result. So the larger the box, 
the higher the dollar amount that has been allocated to this program. And then the darker the shade of the box, the higher that specific program scored to those results. So on a scale of zero to four, four being a higher score. So certainly feel free to poke around and play with our um, model that's on the website. And if you have any questions, um, as Melody mentioned, we do have that email address. You can send your questions that way and she will be able to answer those for you. Mm -hmm. Turning it over then to Annie Noble. Thank you. Um, so Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, I'm Annie Noble, Environmental Services Manager in Public Works and Natural Resources. And I'll be presenting the sustainability budget tonight. So I have 10 slides, but I'll be brief. Um, I'm going to start out by looking at what is sustainability, what is the role of the program, and what are the funding sources. And then I'll talk about the work that's currently underway and go into the 2021 budget. And I'll conclude with a list of other citywide efforts that are related to sustainability. So Sustainability is often described as meeting our needs without compromising the needs of future generations. The sustainability plan identifies 10 topic areas which contain specific actions that are categorized into immediate, near-term, and mid-term timeframes. This year was the first year that a sustainability fund was established with funding contributions from various city funds. So on this slide, I've listed the major components of this year's budget. The proposed 2021 budget is $359,000, and that's excluding salaries and a $50,000 one-time request for an update to the sustainability plan. So um, the 2021 proposed budget assumes $150,000 for work funded through the sustainability tax, and that includes a 25% match. Of the $150,000, $80,000 has already been committed, and that's for a two-year fixed-term grant and program coordinator position. So in addition to the funding in the 2021 sustainability program budget, there are many proposed citywide budget requests that help support the strategies of the sustainability plan, and I have several of those listed here on the slide. Good evening, Mayor Bagley, members of council, Valerie Dodd, Executive Director of NextLight. I'm happy to be back in front of you. I'm gonna talk a little bit about 2020 results, which I think, Mayor, you've been interested uh, in lately. And I'll talk also about 21 or 2021 budgets and strategies. So really our goals and objectives are gonna be the same probably year to year. We might tweak some of the numbers, but really what we're trying to do is drive customer growth. We're trying to make sure as many people, as many residents in Longmont as possible have access and actually have our service and can get it and afford it. So that's very important. Um, we've done a few things in 2020 and late 2019 that have improved our customer experience. Uh, one is really recent. We have implemented a new IVR system so that customers calling into either LPC or NextLight don't have to go to the same call queue, don't have to wait in line. They don't get confused about reporting a NextLight outage versus an electric outage. Now I'm going to talk about customer acquisition. So think of that as the sales and marketing arm of NextLight's operation. So, so let's talk about customer results and outlook. So 2020, we're experiencing about a 9% year-over-year -year growth. Pretty phenomenal. Um, we're hoping to end the year with 22,500 customers. Um, that is 800 above the original forecast and budget, so pretty excited about that. Okay, quick updates on the network. Um, boy, we're growing our customer base by nine, six to 9%, and guess what? Because of COVID, uh, data utilization consumption has gone up about 15%, so we need more bandwidth. So we've, uh, we're spending a fair bit of capital on 100G transport circuits to make sure that we have the capacity up to the internet. And the employees, a huge piece of our success with NextLight. Super excited about our team. Uh, we were able to finalize our NextLight organization this year. Uh, we've got 40 employees, and that's about how it's going to stay for next year. We um, were able to organize in such a fashion that many existing employees were able to take a new role with maybe a slight increase in pay and responsibility. So a lot of good opportunity for most of the uh, employees in the organization. And I'm winding down the good news. So this is kind of the summary slide. Customer count up 6%, employee count virtually flat. 
revenue is up 9%. And that's just because we have higher paying customers. Originally, we had a lot of people in that charter membership, that $45. Some of those have churned out, been replaced with $65 customers, which is our rate card today and very competitive. Um, that also offsets some of that $14.95 uh, price point that we have in the market. Um, our operating expense is up just a little bit, some one-time expenses. The CIP, I talked about last time, it's up due to about $800,000 worth of one-time expenses. We continue to get a lot of recognition. I get a lot of phone calls and requests for media interviews because of our success. Um, we make it look easy, and I, I warn everyone that it's not as easy as the team's made it look. Um, we've got rec gotten recognition for the low-income offer that we did to so great news. And then once again, PC Magazine has recognized our um, exceptional product and ranked us the fastest ISP in the Western region and the fourth fastest in the country. All right, any questions from council for Ms. Dodd, Councilmember Christensen? Not a question, just a comment. Um, about once a year, I call up your uh, tech support folks and they're always fast and they're always have a good sense of humor and they always get me taken care of in no time. It's usually, okay. thank you very much. You have very good customer service and that's really, really important. Council member Yago Faring and then council member Martin. Well, I have a question on the uh, numbers you gave us, the 72 for the two free month, the 432 for the in income qualifying offers. Are those, um, do those numbers, are they overlapping? So what, are these individual, like separate? They're on separate, yes, council member, or Mayor Bagley, council member. I'm so sorry, I'm still out of practice. Um, no. th those numbers are separate, they're on separate rate plans. So. And then which ones, because I've, I've heard from parents that maybe they didn't qualify for one. Are there other offers? So let's say they don't qualify for the two, three months. Could they do the, during the next slide? Or what is, how is that structured? Uh, generally, if they would qualify, if they're part of the school lunch program, they would qualify for sharing the next slide. Okay. Um, if they have some kind of federal um, assistance or any kind of subsidies whatsoever, then they can qualify for the discounted service, the income qualifying service. So if they don't qualify for something, it's not if for one of the sharing the next slide or the two free months, there's still other options if they call and ask? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Councilmember Martin? Um, yes, I recently learned that um, an acquaintance in a uh, mobile home park doesn't have access to Nextlight. Um, is that true of all of the mobile home parks in, in the city or, or only certain ones? Or are, what, what outreach effort are we trying to make to, to convert those? Because a lot of people there need this. Um, Mayor Bagley, um, Council Member Martin, uh, the issue probably is that the management company for that trailer park probably is getting um, door fees from a competitor and therefore they're making more revenue by having just one carrier in there. And so they have not signed a service agreement letting us in. So that has been um, a continual problem. We have about 2,000 premises for which we cannot get a service agreement. Dr. Waters? Well, thanks, Mayor Bagley. Valerie, uh, well, it's a great report uh, on great work. I mean, it's, it's very impressive what, uh, what you've been able to do with an outstanding, I agree with Council Member Christensen, customer service is extraordinary. I mean, you got the right people doing the right stuff. What will it take for us uh, to get to that place where we can say there are no families with young children in Longmont who, who are not connected? And, I, and, and, they, and the editorial I'll add is, um, I don't know how we could talk about equity in the city of Longmont and not ensure that every family with young children's connected, that they are connected. Valerie, I'm curious, you know, what, what's it take for us to get there? Um, Mayor Bagley, uh, Council Member Waters, totally appreciate the question. And um, that's certainly the goal. And I didn't include our vision statement because I was trying to cut back on my words, but it is truly a fully connected Longmont. And so I, I can say, and I think Jim and Teresa can back me, that nothing was turned down. Um, Harold and team and others have been very supportive of what we're trying to do, partly because we're an enterprise fund. They see that here in the coming years, we'll have some, be spending off some extra cash um, 
So I don't think that's the issue. I think it's partnering with the right people to get the right grants and the right foundations to contribute. And we started having those meetings, thanks to you again. And so we're trying to work through that. And so I'm confident that we're going to get some additional funding, but I also am going to set it up and say that um, my boss, Dale, and I are thinking about this in a different way as well, trying to see, is there a way that we don't have to be dependent maybe on a foundation and that this can be part of our, really our business strategy, but I, I need to talk to Dale and Harold about that a little further. I think when we talk about social equity and the work that we're doing in, internally right now, it's also how do we work with our cultural brokers to really get the word out? Because I think that's the piece too. We've talked about this a little bit. You can put information out, but in some cases you don't, not all information. And so how do we connect within various groups throughout our community via our cultural brokers so we can really get that connection in and be able to provide those services? All right, now that we're back, Jim, you wanna keep going with that budget presentation? Yeah, next, uh, actually, Dave Hornbacker is going to, I believe, introduce the next item on automatic metering. I'm David Hornbacher, the Executive Director of Longmont Power and Communications. So during the CIP presentation, Council asked for additional information on uh, the capital project ELE-099, which is the advanced metering. So this project is the largest LPC project in our budget, and it transforms the current handheld uh, you know, electric metering system to a robust two-way communication system. And this provides the framework and technology to engage our customers regarding their energy use, the integration of distributed energy resources, create a connection between the renewable energy production and uh, to consumption, and other activities and policies that are essential to reach our goal of 100% renewable energy by year 2030. I'm Mayor Bagman, members of Council, Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager. I'm here to chat with you about the Longmont Public Media Contract and Public Access uh, Media for the Future in 2021. Um, so as you may remember, a couple of years ago during these budget presentations, particularly during the financial policies, the City Council asked for staff to go out for a competitive process for public access television services. Uh, the Longmont Observer was the successful um, bitter during that process, now known as Longmont Public Media, um, and part of the, the reason that they won the bid was because they had a business model that really incorporated a makerspace idea um, at the Carnegie Building, being able to gather and have classes and create content and all these great things that were uh, proposed as part of the RFP. As you already can guess, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly put um, certainly more than a damper on those plans for Longmont Public Media. And there are some concerns that in 2021, that contract cannot be renewed as it is today. Uh, so you may notice in your package, you have a few different options that we would like for you to consider, mostly because the city council is the sole decision maker on the contract for public access services. So I've presented a few different options for council to consider. I'll go through those briefly. We're hoping for some direction from council tonight, and then we'll continue on with negotiations and bring back a contract as we get closer to the end of the year. We, we can ask a question. I'm going to actually move that we actually uh, endorse option three, the staff recommendation. All right, no second. Councilmember Christensen. Uh, no, I don't want to second that. I want to... Oh, I know, that's what I meant, but go ahead. I would move that we... So you didn't get a second? Okay. Um, all right. I would move that we endorse option two. Um, and I'd be happy to explain why, but let's see if I get a second. <laughs> I'll second it. We had a lot of, a lot of work was put into already um, sending this out for competitive bid. And then they got started and they've done quite good work considering all they had running against them. Um, I don't want us to start all over again. Um, I just think we should have a little faith in them. And I really find the, the third thing of having uh, no station manager, no employees, only contractors. They've already been working as contractors for a year. That's, um, that's not a good situation. It's not fair and I want them to be paid employees. That's the right thing to do. Councilmember Martin. 
Yeah, uh, I would I would be for uh, Council Member Christensen's augmentation proposal. First of all, um, second, I uh, there was a, a plan under discussion for a while where um, the cable trust funding would be front loaded so that the uh, uh, Longmont Public Media could continue at its existing service level and um, we could look at supplemental funding in the second half of the year based on whether conditions have changed or not and whether they are able to start uh, reopening the maker space and producing uh, their own revenue that they had had plans for expanding their service level based on uh, increased capability to add value to the community. Um, so first of all, what happened to, to that funding approach? Uh, and uh, yeah, let's start with that. What happened to that funding approach? Mayor Bagley, Council Member Martin, I think that what's important to note is that funding doesn't usually become more avail available later in the year. I mean, you could certainly designate this as part of the budget and we could write the contract any way that, you're, that you would like to see. We don't receive all of the franchise fees at once. We receive them in chunks as well, which is why the current contract is written the way it is. Peg fees particularly, we don't give them until we get it. We give it to them as soon as we receive it. Okay. Um, I, the other question that I had is, uh, we, you said put it out to bid again. Um, I can't imagine what kind of bids you would get for the current funding level, um, which I, I'm, I'm assuming would be pretty much a cap on what anyone could expect to be awarded. So I, I'm not even, can you explain what that option is in there for? Uh, Mayor Bagley, Council Member Martin, only because it was a previous direction of the council. It's always an option if you wanted to put it out and see what else was out there, but I would say we just did complete the last one, so it's not recommended. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, my, my personal preference would be to fund them with option one and, um, and, and hold their feet to the fire to deliver, and, I, and I'm confident they will. Um, I, think, I, I, think that's, I think that's what we ought to do. The difference of $40,000 uh, and a $371 million budget, I don't think is that big a deal. Uh, I, I'd like to hear more from Jim. I think, I think we've got some one-time money that, where we don't have to commit the contingency. And I think we have enough one-time money to fund this at, at, at option number one. If, if we're not gonna consider option number one, I'm certainly gonna support number two, I think of the, of the, of the five options we heard from Sandy. Uh, my preference would be to fund them at option one. Joan. Thank you, uh, Mayor Bagley. Um, actually, this is a question for Sandy. I'm curious as to why staff recommended option three. What was it in option three that staff thought was worth, worth supporting? Mayor Bagley, Council Member Peck, I think we were concerned about bringing any enhancements of services or anything that's going to cost additional funding, particularly in this budget process. Would, was that uh, a hiring or only going with uh, contractors part of that? I believe that would be the plan from Longmont Public Media is that they would only be able to hire contract work to be able to liaison. It would, it would basically be a very bare bones type of um, operation at that point. Okay, thank you. All right, Councilman Martin. Um, yeah, so Sandy, this question is for you too and it has two parts. One is, um, you have a, a really high level of, of devotion and, and uh, passion and commitment on the, uh, among the existing LPM employees. Um, and so there is a big opportunity cost for letting those people go. Um, how do you value that as opposed to what you would spend this budget money on um, if you weren't spending it on paying those uh, wages. Mayor Bagley, Council Member Martin, that's a pretty tough one to discuss because then you're talking about everything that everybody asked for in the entire budget and how we value that in comparison to this. I will tell you that running a, a cable 
television station is not easy and there's a huge learning curve to it. And so certainly Longmont Public Media and city staff have been learning together over the last several months um, on all kinds of things from not only equipment and how to do it and all these different pieces, but also programming and communication and conversations. And so um, to some extent, I would say that's priceless. <laughs> Um, and you know what I what I would mention is just that we wanted to make sure that we were presenting you options that also left the the revenues as they were intact with no changes. And so we wanted to give you the entire gamut um, of, of conversation. So I would say that we value it very much uh, that they are able to do the work that they are able to do. Um, and we certainly wouldn't recommend, like I said, going out for bid again. That's not our recommendation. <laughs> um, and uh, LPM, I mean, I understand they're not city employees. But in fact, um, there has been so much work for them to do in terms of crisis management that uh, they, they really are essential, learning curve or not. Um, what do you think, uh, Polly? Do you think you could, you could spring for option one? Well, I personally can't spring for anything, but I, I just think that... <laughs> But, um, you know, it's just very difficult right now. You know, we're all, we're going to have to cut on a lot of things. And I just think it's, it would be really hard to spring for $117,000 more. I, I think it's going to be hard to uh, go for $76,000 more. So. Mayor Pro Tem? Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I believe a couple of the ideas that I heard uh, spoken about so far that I think are important. One is flexibility. I believe I heard Assistant City Manager Cedar say that there's some flexibility still, and we don't have to necessarily lock in tonight. I think that's important. Uh, one of the other important things I, I think we should talk about is open coverage of governmental affairs. And we know that their city has no ability to help increase coverage uh, through the newspapers and through the Longmont Leader, for instance. But we do have the ability to be as open and transparent as we can by having a robust public media. Um, I also think that kneecapping basically the Longmont Public Media Organization in a completely unprecedented year budget-wise after just receiving the, the contract because I think that their level of service is above and beyond what we had before in the city, uh, as far as all the various boards and commissions that they're going, as well as the other things that they're providing service for. And so a big ask, I actually agree with Council Member Waters in that 117 to me is not a big ask uh, compared to 76. I don't think that that's a big amount of room to cover when we're talking about the budget that we have, as well as the services that are actually being provided to the public. These are one of very obvious reasons, or one of the various obvious services that is provided to the public that they can see and find to be tangible and see what they're getting for their money. So I am open to option two. I prefer option one personally, but I'll vote uh, either way, knowing that we have the flexibility moving forward that say, we go with option two this time and find out that there is some wiggle room to get us up to 117, then I would also support amending it at that time as well. Um, but I think this is a vital, a vital service that I don't think we should be looking at cutting uh, as far as transparency between the city of Longmont and the residents of Longmont. Dr. Waters, I don't think you've had to. You're right, I have not had to. So thank you for acknowledging me for a second comment. Um, I think if we want, first of all, I appreciate Mayor Pro Tem's comments and, and the other comments that have been made about the value that, that LPM has brought to the city, I think far beyond what we'd experienced in the past. I think if we want to position them, acknowledging this is one-time money, as Jim said, we want to position them to be able to be viable in 2022 that I think we need to make the investment this year that optimizes that, poss that possibility. I think if we put them on a shoestring, which I think that option two does, it keeps them kind of status quo. Um, I, I just think if we're gonna take, if we're gonna invest one time 
to try to get them ready to, to be viable over the long run, then we ought to commit to option one as, as the $40,000 is not going to be big a difference in a, in a 2020 budget and, uh, and give them the chance to, to hit the ground and, and finish the race. All right, I'm going to go ahead and call on Joan. So um, thank you, Mayor Bagley. So here's my thought. There are other things in this budget also that I am I want to bring up about perhaps we should look at as a priority and fund. So is there any way, when does this contract have to be signed, Sandy? Mayor Bagley, uh, Council Member Peck, they're, they're under contract currently until the end of December. So this contract, you know, we wouldn't have to bring back to you until we got closer to the end of the year. So I was wondering uh, if we could put this off until we bring out all of the issues that we would like to fund. And Jim can actually give us some, some hard numbers and, and how, you know, one-time funding I agree with, but there are other things that I think we should look at funding a little better as well. I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna probably vote no so we can vote for number one, but if two passes, that's okay too. It's not the end of the world. All right, so we've got a motion on the table and uh, de uh, delegating staff to proceed with option two. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right, all of, that's an aye. Council Member Dago firing. All right, all opposed, say nay. 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 Is that a nay, Marsha? Were you I or nay, Marsha? I was an I because I thought it was good to put a stake in the ground for at least that much. I wanted to so go the, with Mayor our, Pro Tem's plan. But, all right, so with the motion passes four to three with Councilmember Martin, Councilmember Christensen, Councilmember Peck, and Councilmember uh, Hidalgo Faring uh, voting for the motion. So, all right, let's move on to actually, Jim, is there anything else? Yes, there are just a few more budget presentations. Uh, the tax was uh, passed in late 2018, began to receive revenue uh, about a month after that. And uh, the first full year was 2019. We had $265,000 of tax revenue. So in 2021, we're projecting the tax revenue to come in at about 410,000, which is uh, sim similar to the pace that we're on this year. So there will be money uh, in excess of budget for t in 2020. Uh, the 2021 proposed budget so far only includes the half of the amount, 205,000, again, designated for affordable housing. The DDA Act budgets actually have uh, six individual funds within the DDA. And then in addition to that, they also do propose budgets to you for the downtown parking fund in the general improvement district. So I've given you all a lot of information on those budgets within the council communication. I'm not gonna uh, take you through them. All right, we can move into the final item and that's uh, the Gallagher Amendment. So uh, first I wanna point out that, um, you know, the city's, uh, uh, what we do with uh, the property tax detail, what we do, we, it's basically administered by the county. We receive money from the, from the county every month based on their collections, uh, but the, uh, the actual administration of property tax is done by the county assessor's office and the, the collections and uh, forwarding to us by the, the county treasurer's office and they all file, have to follow the state statutes in those regards. So, uh, you know, we're not the experts on, on a property tax, um, but on the, having said that, I put together information that I have gathered from a few sources, uh, mostly from CML. Uh, the, actually the best source that I have found of information on this topic is in the election blue book. Uh, it does have quite a bit of detail, it's useful. So, but I, so uh, the property tax uh, is paid on a property's, um, uh, sorry, I'm just fix my slides here. A property's actual value. Uh, assessor determines the actual value of a property. Um, the actual value is then multiplied by the assessment rate to get the assessed or taxable value. But the assessed value is multiplied then by the tax rate, which is our mill levy and any entity's mill levy to get to the amount of the tax owed. So the Gallagher Amendment uh, passed in 1982. And the, the intention of it was to maintain a ratio between the taxable value of property 
as 45% residential and 55% non-residential. That's the ratio it was back in 82, and it intended to keep that in place. And it's statewide, not on a, a say a city or a county level, but the whole state. So Amendment, P, Amendment B would repeal the Gallagher Amendment. General Assembly also adopted a statute that if this does pass, the, they would freeze the current assessment rates at 7.15% residential and 29% non-residential. And that uh, is something that could be changed by future legislators, but they could only reduce either of those rates uh, because again, because of Tabor, they're not able to increase those rates without voter approval. So the residential values continue to grow. Um, Non-residential values are expected to drop in the coming year, uh, in the next uh, assessment year. And due to the impact of uh, uh, COVID on business. Councilmember Christensen. Jim, the, the state legislators put this on the ballot because they've been squabbling about this for 10 years and they couldn't figure out a way to fix it. So they're kind of throwing it off on us. But why couldn't they just adjust, make a, a different adjustment to the proportions? Is that set in the law? The, the, the Gallagher Amendment is in the Constitution. So what yes. they're, do, they're doing is, is they're following the Gallagher Amendment uh, right. every assessment year. Their hands are tied in that respect. So there's no flexibility in adjusting those ratios? Not as long as Gallagher is okay. in place as Okay, as I written. understand. All right, John. Thank you, uh, Ryan. Uh, Jim, I just, well, actually, I want to throw this out to all of council. We all know that the library needs to be funded. It's in the feasibility study. It has been talked about here for years. Um, it is underfunded. Jim, I was wondering if there is a way from perhaps cutting those budgets, I know the directors aren't going to like this idea, by a half a percent or uh, some of the one-time funding either from marijuana uh, or the other places, if we could put more money into the library. We've really got to keep that library viable and up. I know that we probably can't fund it to the extent that the feasibility study said it needs to be funded, but but could you come back to us with some cobbled monies that we could put into it, whether it's one time, whether it's uh, ongoing, and, and let us know if that's a possibility. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the last um, item, the rental fee uh, moratorium. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Karen Roney with Community Services. So I will introduce this item, which Council asked us, uh, asked staff to bring back uh, recently. And um, I believe in August of this year, the City and County of Bloomfield did adopt an ordinance which uh, enacted a temporary prohibition of property owners to assess late fees uh, when there was um, late rental payments which basically uh, um, in, in essence temporarily prohibits property owners from um, assessing fees for late rental payments. The, it suggests that the prohibition ends with, um, with either the expiration of the Centers for Disease Control Eviction Moratorium Order, which is uh, set to expire the end of this year or unless that is extended um, or when the governor resends the um, declaration of the emergency disaster related to COVID-19. The thing we wanted to point out is that uh, Governor Polis did appoint a, um, a, a task force that has uh, that basically started to meet um, the mid part of, of September to also advise the, um, the governor as well as the, um, the Department of Local Affairs on various strategies to really look at housing stabilization. So um, they are to bring back their recommendations to, to the governor and to DOLA by mid-October. There was a 30-day window once they had their initial meeting. And, um, and, and at this point, really turn it over to city council to provide staff direction on whether to bring back a, an ordinance for first reading or and, and any modifications 
or anything else that you would like to direct us to do? Karen, uh, uh, thank you for explaining that task force. When I read it, I realized that um, late fees were not really the target of what they were getting at. But if they do uh, address that and come up with some ideas, I would like to add that the temporary, uh, let's see, how do I put it? That this temporary thing would also include whatever that task force comes up with with late fees, because that may determine a different end date for this and a better one, a better outcome. When I talked to Susan Spalding later, in, earlier in the spring, she mentioned that she did uh, renter landlord one-on-ones to work out some kind of a situation in the, and that the city could use that neighbor to neighbor fund to uh, help with the landlords getting some support from the rent if the renter could not working out a compromise between them. And the reason I'm saying this is that I don't want the property owners or the landlords to think that the city is not concerned about them losing revenue that they need to pay the mortgages on these places. It was Councilmember Christensen and then Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Carmen and Karen I, and, and Harold. I, I just think it's, it's very important that property owners understand that this is not punitive towards them, We're just trying to keep people in their homes. And um, that the idea is that if everybody can work together a little bit and they can use the city to work together to get this help that they need so that everybody winds up doing a little bit better, yeah. Uh, Marsha? Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I, uh, I just would like to say that, that I think the more holistic approach and um, you know, offering assistance to tenants so that they can um, meet their obligations to their, their contractual obligations to the landlords is a better approach um, than uh, reducing their obligation under contract. And the reason for that is that the latter uh, can have un, unintended consequences. I was, I was just going to say that I, I don't think that, that council has the expertise or the, the, or nor should we have the authority to be telling private property owners um, how they should charge their late fees. We, and um, I, just, I just think it's a huge mistake and I think it's overstepping our authority. I understand the, the point of what Broomfield did with this one. Um, I feel like for us, due to the lack of data release, that we're going from not an A to B, an A status quo to B solution issue here. I think we're going from A status quo to D, A solution, but we haven't taken the time to connect the steps yet. I'd like to see us provide support for those folks that are possibly incurring late fees that they can't afford, or, or as was, I think, proposed in the council communication that we might look at a cap on late fees before we look at an absolute ban. Um, I just feel that there are some steps in between uh, where we are at now and what's being proposed in this ordinance before we get to the straight ban. Uh, I appreciate the Mayor Pro Tem's comments about uh, getting a little bit more information. I, I, I think that would be helpful as well. And, and in that information, uh, Karen, you, you were specific to point out that there's been really no analysis of unintended consequences. And I can, I'm sitting here imagining what the unintended consequences might be, right? If the city says I can't collect late fees, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna double up on my security deposit, right? Or I'm gonna, I'm gonna do things that protect my interest and in the long run hurt the very people we're trying to help. So I'm sympathetic to what, um, to the ordinance and to what Broomfield did. Um, but I, but I would like to get a little bit more data, both in terms of the, the kind of data uh, Aaron was talking about, but also what your take is on unintended consequences. And it may be that, that uh, uh, Susan has a pretty good idea of that as well. So if the governor doesn't do anything, then we are starting from scratch uh, in mid-October. 
Um, this ordinance does not ban outright late fees. It bans any late fees that have to do with COVID um, hardships. And you have to prove that you have either been laid off or that you have had COVID and thus were unable to work. It's really a very modest little ordinance and it will prevent a lot of people from becoming evicted by the end of October. If we do nothing, then it'll be by the end of November. And then, <laughs> you know, we're just talking about keeping people off the streets. I wasn't suggesting that we not proceed, Polly. I was suggesting that uh, as we move forward, we'll have more information from whatever the governor does before we would, before this would be before us for a second reading. And in the meantime, we could, we could benefit from the analysis of unintended consequences that Karen and or, you know, others on her crew could do and, and inform this. So I, I, I favor moving forward actually with something. I, I was just observing that, that we're gonna learn a lot more before we get to a second reading at the end of October on this, so. The other piece is, so when we have a landlord who is struggling to pay off their, to pay their mortgage, make their mortgage payment because of a tenant who's fallen behind, would they be able to apply for any of the, would the CARES funding piece be able to apply for them? I think what we would want is, is the landlord to connect the tenant with us okay. so that they could get the CARES funding that we have available. So okay. they, we would then in turn pay the landlord. And, and I think it's really important to note too that as you go through the process and it comes to surface that the reason why the tenant is behind has nothing to do with COVID, they will be charged a late fee. So, you know, you have these bad players on both sides. I mean, I rent a home. I love the per the homeowner who we work really well together and you know my husband's a plumber so it's we, we have a, a good open relationship between landlord tenant so and i know i hear that happen often but i also hear that that's not happening and what we can do to really ensure that people are not because of covid getting kicked out to the streets and that that's what i was getting at make sure that the property owners the management companies know that before they go to the nth degree of uh, late fees or whatever to direct that resident to Susan Spalding or whatever website we need to go. All right, so what do you need from us, Karen? Well, we, we could use some direction, direction. On, uh, <laughs> on whether you want us to bring forth this ordinance for first reading like it is, modify it, don't do it at all, or something else. So. All right, there's a, there's a motion on the table. Uh, I don't see any more uh, discussion or debate, so let's go ahead and vote on it. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. 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 All right, raise your hand if you said aye. All right, so the motion carries four to three. So we'll proceed with that. Mayor and Council comments. Anyone? Councilor, uh, Councilor Christensen. I just like everybody to remember um, that the opening for the Day of the Dead is at the museum is October 1st. And it's um, a wonderful time for everybody around the world to remember all the people who've gone before them. Thanks. Yes, I would actually like everyone to know that uh, the League of Women Voters has done a really fine job of deeply researching the issues on uh, the Colorado ballot this year, all the way down to, um, to municipal level um, issues and uh, that their voter guide goes online live uh, at 411vote.org uh, on October 2nd, which gives you a week and a half, a good 10 days to really study the ballot before you have to fill it in and still vote really, really early. 
um, that, you know, they're a nonpartisan organization. They did wonderful research and they endorsed both of Longmont's ballot questions. So everybody go to 411 vote and uh, get that get that ballot in early. I move to adjourn. I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. All right. See you next week, guys. Thanks. Bye.